we will begin our discussion of sections seven one through seven and five. Um, this will cover a bunch of topics. Uh, it's best just to put it as one instead of doing each section. So um, we are going to define something called a Laplace transform in this video. <laughs> To begin, though, I would like to talk about um, something that you've worked with for a long time, something called an operator, um, or sometimes a transformation, either way. Um, you have dealt with this when you do a, a derivative, for, for instance. Um, this derivative is an operator, right? It doesn't actually have a value. It does something to something else. So what this means is I'm putting in a function, I put in x squared, and I get a function out. It does something to it. Um, we see this also with our integral, right? The integral of x, we'll do that, dx is 1 half x squared, right? I plug in a function, I get one out. And I don't know if you've seen these other notations here. We use d or dx there. We also even have an integral sign with the d there due to the negative one. But these are operators. Um, you guys use this cosine as an operator, cosine of something, right? It takes a value and spits out a value. In this case, with an operator, um, it takes in a function. And cosine actually wouldn't be an operator. I think that's just a function itself. An operator sends a function to a function. I plug x squared in, I get 2x out. That's what the operator does. It sends x squared to 2x, right? I have a new operator that I'm going to introduce today called the Laplace transformation. What's going to feel weird about this is it's completely based on this definition. We're not going to get back, uh, get into the background of where it came from um, or anything like that. It is a brand new definition, and it's going to feel very strange because in the past what we've done with definitions is I'll define it, we use the definition, and then we find some tricks, and then you get a table, but you mainly rely on the tricks. For this, we're going to learn how to use it, what it is, how it's defined meaning, and then we're going to use a table. Um, there won't be patterns. The only pattern that we're going to really pick up on are a few, and it comes from a table. Okay, so the Laplace transform, remember, a transformation or an operator takes a function. So this operation takes this script L, right? We write it like this, of some function f of t. After we do that, we call it big F of s. Okay, one thing I do want you to notice here, it was in terms of t, now that's in terms of s. Okay, so the definition here, I know it's a weird one. I have f of t. And I put f of t in, in an integral, and this is a, an indefinite integral. Um, sorry, a definite integral, but a improper integral, meaning it's going to infinity there. So notice it's 0 to infinity. We take the function itself, and we times by e to the negative st. st was whatever we plugged in. It, during this integral, it's in, in um, terms of t there, S is a constant, but as soon as you're done with the integral, notice that the function here is in terms of S. So this is what I mean. I'm going to write in one statement here just to make sure you're following. I plug in a function of T. I put it inside this integral, and I'm going to get an answer, and my answer is going to be some function, but now it's going to be in terms of S. T is going to be gone, and we can tell that it's going to be gone if we look at the integral, right? We're going to run... We actually have bounds here, 0 to infinity, and those are all going to get ran into t. t is going to run from 0 to infinity. Now, we know how to do these limits. We can't think about it that way, so we have to do a limit, and we just let that upper bound, capital N at the top, go to infinity. Then we can actually do the integral and think about what happens. Okay, so here's some uh, terminology. L is the Laplace transformation operator. Uh, we say capital F of S is the Laplace transformation of F of T. S is the transformation uh, parameter. In general, typically in the grand scheme of things of all math, S is typically a complex number. In this course, we'll keep it real. All right, so that is the definition of a Laplace. We are going to answer a question now using the definition. We're only going to do the definition probably throughout these videos, and then you're going to use a table from now on. So. Okay, so let's take this. So it says use the Laplace of f of t using that definition. So it is a piecewise definition. 
I'm going to graph um, this thing. I'm going to extend this the graph here just a bit. And I'm going to put a, I need a negative one there. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to graph this graph. Okay, it goes at, when t is zero, it's at negative one, has a slope of one, and it's going to change <clears throat> at two. Two will keep this graph, right? And then this should be actually less than two. So what we'll do is get rid of this dot. Remember when it's not there to find, we put a hole. So we'll put that because the we have a problem if we don't. So mark that out and put that last thing. All right, then it's three at that point. So at three, it's jumping up here and it's gonna just stay three forever. Not for two. Okay, so we have this function. It's this piecewise and I know the definition um, let's write that out. The definition of f of t, if I take the Laplace transform, it is the integral of e to the negative st times that function dt. And this is from 0 to infinity. All right, so to plug this in, we're at 0 to infinity of e to the negative st. And now the problem is, is I have two different functions. <clears throat> so I need to put that f of t in, but instead what I'm gonna do is just keep the first function. I know from zero to two, it's t minus one dt. And then I just do the same thing now, two to infinity of e to the negative st times three. That was the next function dt. <clears throat> I can do the integration that's inside here. Right, it's not going to be pretty. Let's go ahead and go for it. Um, I'm going to, well, let's leave it like that. Right, we're going to do a, uh, I'm going to do integra tabular integration. So we have S D I, and then I'm going to put T minus one here, and then E to the negative S T there. Remember, this is plus, minus, plus, minus. Okay, so I get one, zero. It goes away really quick. Um, remember, this is in terms of t. <clears throat> so for e to the negative st, if I take the integral, I get one over negative s e to the negative st. Think about if you were to take the derivative now, how you'd get back, right? Um, and then I got to do one more. It's the same result, but it's going to come out as a positive because I'll get the negative again. One over s squared e to the negative st. There we go. All right, so now I can use integration by um, parts here. <clears throat> uh, I can drop my bounds. So this first integral is t minus 1 uh, times negative 1 over s e to the negative st minus, uh, and then, okay, so remember, it's here, 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 here. So that minus is going to be there, okay, good, one over s squared e to the negative st, and this is ran from zero to two. And then I'm gonna go ahead and start rewriting this because it's not gonna be as easy here. So I'm rewriting it to be something we can actually work with now. Okay, that whole thing becomes, when we plug everything in, we get negative, let me make sure I get this right. Negative 1 over s e to the negative 2s minus 1 over s squared e to the negative 2s. Okay, I think that's all we can, oh, and then minus. Okay, and then we're going to have inside, if I'm plugging in 0 for all my t's, I get uh, 1 over s minus a one over s squared. Okay, you go through and check that plug two, plug zero in, that's all we did. It's just a normal integral. Okay, I can do this integral now here. Okay, so I get the limit as n approaches infinity of, okay, we can do this. This is gonna be negative one over s e to the negative st, running it from, oh, and we got a three in there, and we're just gonna throw it up top, two to n. All right, I got negative 1 over s e to the negative 2s minus 1 over s squared e to the negative 2s. We'll get all this put together here in a moment. 
1 over s minus 1 over s squared. Yep. Okay, so it matches my notes. And then this becomes, if I'm plugging in in, okay, I'm keeping the limit for a moment. Remember, these are all going into t's. Um, so we get negative 3 over s e to the negative n s minus negative 3 over s e to the negative 2 uh, s. T's are gone. We plugged in T's. Okay, so that's just plugging those in. Right, we know that's minus that negative. Okay, so we get, well, I'm going gonna, gonna to add a page to this. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite that now. Negative 1 over s e to the negative 2 s minus 1 over s squared e to the negative 2 s minus 1 over s minus 1 over s squared. And a lot of rewriting really what's happening here. So the first part was just an integral. I hope you followed. And then all we're doing now is this limit. It's just old calc. All right. I want you to think about this as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, that negative is going to make that e to something go bottom, and it's going to make it go to zero. Right? I'll rewrite it for you here. Negative 3 over s e to the n s. As at n gets really big, that denominator is going to go to zero, right? So if, or the denominator gets really big, so we're going to have like negative 3 over an infinity if you want to think about it that way. I know we don't write that. But that's where it's going on bottom, which means it's going to zero. So this whole thing goes to zero. That second thing doesn't even have um, an n in it. So I'm just going to write it down the way it is. All right, we can start combining some of these like terms here. Um, let's do, okay, so what do we have? I think this is a like term with this. I'm seeing that correctly. So I get, uh, that's going to be 3 minus 1. So it's 2 over s e to the negative 2s minus 1 over s squared e to the negative 2s. And then um, let's go ahead. Okay, there's some kind of sign. Oh, no, there it is. 1 over s plus 1 over s squared. There we go. Great. Everything's still in order. And then we can put... If we wanted to, we could put these e's together. Um, so this is 2 over s minus 1 over s squared. Take that e to the negative 2s out. I mean, it doesn't make it much better. But there we go. There's a good answer. So that is the Laplace transform. Um, I know you may feel a bit overwhelmed right now, and that's okay. Um, it's kind of weird. But remember, it's just it takes a function and makes a new function. So I want I want to recap real quick. Um, we're taking the Laplace of this function that they defined for us, right? So what we did, um, the Laplace is defined like this, right? So there's my Laplace, and I plugged it in. But instead of doing one integral, we can break this up to two. So we broke it up zero to two, two to infinity, and that what that does is that allows me. Okay, notice now um, that first one is not a hard integral that we can do. Now it's it's messy, and that was okay, but that zero and that two there, we can do that. We can do that as long as that integral is bearable. Integral is bearable, we did it, it's not clean, and then we ran a limit for the rest of it. So we started with this function, f of t. We plugged f of t, so f of t is that, and then the Laplace of f of t was that crazy like function that we had there at the bottom. It was equal to, I'll just screen capture it real quick. Screen capture, I sound like an old man. Um, copy, paste, make smaller. It's equal to that. So we started with this function that was in terms of t, and we took the Laplace transform using the definition, and we got a function of s. Now, you may be thinking, cool, uh, who cares, right? What does this do for us? And this is going to change. Um, we're going to be able to change things that are going to be in terms of S instead of T. And these equations are going to be a little simpler for us to solve. Once we do that, we'll be able to come back 
we'll have a route back sending us back to the normal function. So it's going to be helpful here in a moment. And then I know several engineering degrees actually use the Laplace transform a whole lot. So let's, um, let's take a look at some other ideas. Okay, so we say that an F is a piecewise continuous, and this is what we're going to talk about for a moment. Piecewise continuous on some integral from zero to capital T. Um, if it is continuous on zero to t, except for at a finite number of points where a function has jump do, uh, discontinuities or removal discontinuities. Um, so it is piecewise continuous if it's continuous except for at a finite number of points. And they have to be jump discontinuities or removable discontinuities. Okay. Let me give you some examples of what that means, piecewise continuous. Okay. So here's a picture. Um, something like this. And we get, and I'm not even going to put numbers in because it doesn't really matter. And we'll do, yes. All right, this is a piecewise, piecewise continuous function. All right, it's, a, it's, it follows this definition above. It is continuous on all of these on, and we could put on, let's put zero infinity or something. It's, and the reason is because it has a finite, finite mean being not infinite. It's a finite number of points where the function has jump discontinuities, okay? These are jump discontinuities because if I were to walk along this function right here, I'd have to jump up to get to there, to jump one. Uh, removable discontinuities look like this. That's a removable discontinuity. All right, so given that, let's write that. Give ourselves an um, example there. As long as it's finite, not an infinite number, and we can say that it is a removable. So this is also the same thing, but this is, um, let's write an example for jump. Discontinuities, and then this is removable. Removable. There we go. So the jump discontinuities and the removable discontinuities, um, both of those are piecewise. Um, here is an example of when it is not. So we could take some function, go to some hole there, and then I'm going to put an asymptote right at that hole. And we're going to have some kind of graph like that. All right. Notice that we have, it's not a jump discontinuity because I can't jump here to the next one. It's an infinite down. It's not removable. It doesn't look like the one above. Um, so since the limit as we approach this, this number right here goes down forever. So um, that is what tells me the function is not piecewise continuous. So let's sum that up again because I feel like I was kind of all over the place. Um, the difference is, is we only have little areas here where it's discontinuity, dis, discontinuous, right? It's all the way up until this hole, right? All the way up until that jump, but and then it takes off on the other side. This creates this whole new issue for us of going down forever for, to infinity. Um, it just doesn't fit under the definition. Okay, we have one more definition here. We say function f is of exponential order, um, order c, if there exists constants mc greater than zero, zero such that is true for all t. Um, so, like, give some examples. Let's look at the function g of t equals e to the 3t. Right? This looks something like this, oops, not like that at all. Something like that, maybe, exponential, right? And they're saying, is there some other number that I could put there? Okay, this is e to the 3t. There's some other number that I could make this function, which is f, a g of t, or let's call it f in this case. This f of t, such that I can make, I could pick some m there and some c there, that way that my function's always underneath that. Yeah? And it's, oh, it doesn't even have to be for all numbers. 
just says for all t bigger than t they didn't even introduce what this big t means what it means is that it's above it eventually so i could even take another function and do this okay so i'll do here this one's going to grow faster and the reason is because i'm going to let this one be um uh, eight e to the three t it's definitely big it grows faster than this one um, but not always, right? Before that, that point, it may be underneath, or at some point it goes underneath, maybe. Um, but what matters is there's some big T eventually out here that eventually I get to this big T and all little T's after that, the blue function is above the red function for the rest of those T's. That's what that means. If this can happen, then we say it's of exponential order C. So it's whatever is in the exponent. So this would be of exponential order three. Um, I could, we could even find some other way to make it bigger that way too. Okay, another example, um, consider the function f of t, and we'll say t. All right, this function is a diagonal line, right, right down the middle. And there is an exponential function that is bigger than that. We could just use e to the t. And that looks something like this. It's always bigger than that line, so we would say... Um, this is exponential order 3. This is exponential order 1. I could put any, I could pick any kind of order. I probably could even make it smaller and still eventually, and be above that. Um, actually, if we make it less than 1, we run into some errors because and then I think it, we're going to be looking at it that way. So, right, that's what exponential order means. Um, Hold on, I think I may have one more example. Yeah, we can get a little uh, technical with this. If we had more, anything periodic will be exponential order. Consider, you know, your one of your sign things. I can just put it up here. Right? Eventually it gets above it. It's very easy to show that that has exponential order. Um, there are some that... Are not exponential order that are still e to the t so consider this function f of t equals e to the t squared so e to the t squared i can't find some function that looks like this c t has to look like that where i pick a number for m and i pick a number for c it's still going to always it, it, for some t right for a while this this could be bigger than that one but any function that you pick and that looks like those two this will eventually be bigger than that one. It, and it's because the t's are growing quadratic rates rather than ct, which is a linear rate. So it makes sense that that would be it. So the reason that we talked about those pretty quickly is because it actually is a, uh, a required condition, sufficient condition for the existence of, remember this is our Laplace transform. That's what that L, that big F of S is, right? Um, it is enough to tell me that that exists. We don't go a lot about into existence um, and what's called as ex ex existence and uniqueness. Um, and it's just a philosophy of mine and some articles I read. But here's one that you may use going forward because I know Laplace is very important. If F is piecewise continuous, so we talked about what that means and of exponential order c you know what that means then there is a laplace transform it exists for some c s bigger than c whatever that c is all s's are going to be bigger than that okay a couple of things i want to point out properties here um the as s goes to zero um for any of these and i'll let you encourage you to go take to think about this as s gets goes to zero why do all laplace transforms um go to zero. Why does the limit of each Laplace transform? And I would take maybe a look at the, the example that we had above where we did it by definition. Go look and see and look at those and see how the S's are moving. Um, and then go look at the definition, um, this definition here, and think about as S goes to infinity, what happens to my integral? Okay, well, you can think about this pretty quickly. F of t over e to the st. Well, as s goes bigger, that gets bigger, which means this goes to zero. Integral of that is zero. So 
pretty easy to think about. Now, I mentioned this, and, and I'm about to talk about the big picture. Um, we can do an inverse Laplace, um, an inverse Laplace transformation going backwards looks like this, right? There's the notation, right? It's the inverse Laplace, the normal inverse signal, uh, symbol, negative one exponent. Here's the formula. You aren't going to use that with me. Um, we're not going to use that. We're going to use patterns and using pattern recognition within our tables to go backwards. So even though I'm giving you that definition, you're not going to use it in my class, but know that there is a definition that will take you direct. If you know that you, you know your Laplace transform um, equation, big F of S, that you could just plug it in here. Now think about how terrible this would be because of those bounds. Those bounds are complex numbers. Um, we would not want to use that. Okay, one other thing is uh, L and the Laplace um, and the inverse Laplace are linear operators. What that means is just like um, our derivative is a oops, linear operator, and I'm going to show you here, d dx of, let's say, 3x squared minus 2x. I could do this. I could say, okay, 3d dx of x squared. I also know I can break these apart like this even, d dx of x. I can pull the constants out. We know that. We also know that I can take pluses and minuses and break them up. That's all this is saying here is uh, take a look at the inside argument, a times f plus b times y. And then over here, it looks like, okay, the a came out and the plus came out and the f and y are inside the Laplace. So all it's saying is I can split across plus signs and minuses because those are essentially plus negatives. And I can also pull constants out of my Laplace, which makes sense. And we could prove this if we really wanted to because we could go to this definition and we would have an a right there in front of uh, my, I'd have an A F of T instead of an F of T. And then I could just pull the A out front. Well, what's inside is a definition, which tell me tells me I would get A. So it's pretty easy to follow that. You're never gonna have to do that with me, but it's pretty easy to see why it's a linear operator. Those of you that are going to um, study mathematics, I would encourage you to prove to yourself this is true by starting on this side following this definition and end up right here. Um, I would encourage you to do it if you're a math major. Um, if you're not, I would encourage you to do it anyway. Right, the whole point of this weird Laplace transformation and uh, we'll end the video here, I believe. Let me make sure, yes. The big picture um, is we are going to take a differential equation and we are going to take the Laplace of both sides of our differential equation. What this is going to do is make our differential equation become something that can be solved with algebra rather than just calculus. We would always prefer that because algebra is much easier to solve and then calculus, they're less weird. Um, and then once we solve it in the algebra sense, after we take, we take our Laplace, we solve it, algebra land, we get an answer, and then I take the inverse Laplace of our answer, and that should give me, and it does, gives me an answer to my original DE. It's pretty ingenious. Um, they do this a lot in math. We actually do it quite a bit with imaginary numbers later, too. Somebody asked me at one point, and I can't remember off the top of my head, but um, where imaginary numbers would come in use, and it's very easy to find some uses for it, but um, there are a couple of problems that I wish I could remember right now, but you take it over, work with it as an imaginary thing, and then you bring it back or something like that, and it solves this really easy problem. Um, if I can think of that, I'll, I'll make another video, but that is the big picture of this. Um, it's a very weird, not follow your nose because it's just a, it's a crazy definition. It's not really based on intuition either. And there's some probably intuition in there, but we're not gonna get into it. We're just gonna focus on the solving a differential equation using one of these.